Aerial combat drones have been gaining momentum both in their actual usage in various conflicts around the world and in media which often comments their use. Some claim drones are there to end conventional fighting, to end tanks for example, while others believe drones alone can't do much in a war. Binkov will try to analyze today's combat drone usage and give some perspective. Are drones the unstoppable killers that will change warfare as we know it? Combat drones have proven to be very lethal in recent wars. The key to their use is secure communications data links, and near-military-grade security can also be important online, which is why this video is sponsored by NordVPN. It's a virtual private network app. You can use it from your desktop computer or your mobile device. The app will send and receive all data through a custom encrypted route. The data goes through one of the 5000 plus NordVPN servers. You can choose the location of the servers on your own. So in effect, you can connect online via a different country if you want to. Bandwidth is unlimited, multiple connections are allowed and peer-to-peer -peer sharing is supported and Binkov viewers are getting a special offer. Go to nordvpn.com slash Binkov, use the code Binkov and you will get 68% off a two-year plan and four months extra for free. Stay safe online and click below the video to check out their rates. For decades now, drones have been part of warfare. They were used for recon, for decoys and for making the enemy reveal their positions. Both the US in Vietnam and Iraq and the Israelis in their wars used drones in such capacity. But as technology marched on, the mission set of drones grew. The US famously weaponized their Predator drones, but that was 20 years ago. Israeli Harpy drones, loitering aircraft meant to perform kamikaze strikes on spotted targets, were operational since the 1990s. Since then, not only has technology allowed for even smaller drones to carry weapons or much more complex loitering kamikaze drones, but the number of countries making and selling high-performance drones has increased. Finally, the results of all that technological progress and proliferation is what we're reading about in various news coverage of recent wars. But the writing was on the wall well before. The first combat drones were fairly large and based on recon drones. When you have an aircraft capable of flying for 20 hours high up, then it usually means you can also put some small missiles on it in exchange for shorter flight endurance and somewhat lower flight altitude. The success of today's drones in Syria or over Nagorno-Karabakh is really not much different from the success of US drones in Iraq and Afghanistan. But context is key. When the US used their drones, the enemy was already so battered that their drone operations were really counterinsurgency. Drone successes came after the US military might defeated whatever threat the enemies might have been able to counter the drones with. So US drones flew freely around and picked out their targets. In Syria or in Nagorno-Karabakh, we've had a different context. An enemy that is not fully defeated, an enemy that holds some kind of frontline and drones that are used not to mop up various insurgencies, but are used to actively pursue frontline targets. Those drone attacks were pretty effective, yet some perspective is warranted. Turkey used its drones against Syrian forces, real army and not an insurgent force. Yet the Syrian army has been battered by a decade of war, and on the average they used older technology. While they had some fairly modern S-300 and Panzer SAMs sourced from Russia, a few systems can't make the whole SAM network effective. When one takes a glance at the size of Syrian and Turkish forces, it's very apparent Syria couldn't do much against Turkey, drones or no drones. Moving on to Armenia and Azerbaijan. The Azeris famously used drones to great success against Armenia. But it wasn't really just drones on their own as a revolutionary change. What drones brought to the table are similar capabilities to what regular air superiority could offer, but for a smaller cost and fewer lives lost. When one has enough surveillance data through one's own drones or other sources, and when one has enough drones available, one has two of the three important elements in place to overwhelm the enemy. The third factor is the opponent's defenses. While it is hard to exactly deduce what Armenia had in active and properly manned air defenses, a rough estimate of their systems can be had. 
The first Tor systems were delivered from 2019 onward, and it is possible the number of properly trained crews is not the same as the number of contracted vehicles, even today. Armenia, with the Nagorno-Karabakh region, has a fairly long border. The azeri nakhchivan region in the west means there's even more area that needed to be monitored. So all the Armenian SAM systems, from Cold War ones to Tor and S-300, had to be spread over quite a bit of territory. It is unlikely there were great concentrations of several batteries of various systems overlapping in one small area. And without overlapping SAM networks, individual SAM systems can be threatened. That is true against regular air forces, it was true in Israel's wars in 1973 and 1982, and it is true today when it comes to drones. Estrela 10 is an old system of very poor range and limited self-sufficiency in acquiring targets. If it was used in Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, it might have been used passively, without a radar. It would not be detectable, but that also means the system would be almost useless. The OSA SAM is more capable, but it's fairly old. Even with upgrades, it's still likely 30 years behind modern SAMs. Its radar isn't very powerful and it wasn't designed to find drones. Small drones do have smaller radar signatures, so effective engagement ranges of OSAs could have been compromised against the drones. Furthermore, Turkish-made Bayraktar drones could have used missiles that simply outranged the OSA. Or Israeli-made suicide drones could have been used. OSA, being old, isn't well suited to engaging multiple targets, coming to destroy it. Especially if they're coming from multiple directions. Launching two such drones from opposite ends means an OSA SAM vehicle has a very small chance of defending itself. Using three or more drones virtually guarantees mission success. The TOR system is more modern and thus its radar is harder to jam and can engage more targets at once, but it's also more expensive, and its crew can't be retrained after it's lost, so investing in five or even ten suicide drones per one TOR vehicle might very well be a winning strategy in the long term. More complex systems such as the S-300 are usually too expensive and too risky to be used. First of all, each missile is a complex and pricey item, costing over a million dollars, and the S-300 is really wasted on cheap drones. If one tries to engage drones with the S-300, one shows the location of SAM system's components in the process. So it doesn't matter if several drones are downed, the enemy now knows where S-300 components are and can proceed to overwhelm them with various drones or other attacks. The Russian-made Panzer is a system which was in part designed to deal with drones. It has guns, which can cost-effectively deal with even very cheap drones, and it can intercept suicide drones. It also has fairly cheap missiles, which can deal with small and medium-sized drones from a decent distance. Yet some Panzer vehicles were still successfully destroyed in Syria, both by Turkey and Israel. Why is that? While there is little hard data, most probably because they were overwhelmed or and surprised, both by numbers and jamming. As the emphasis was on making the missiles cheap so they can engage even cheap drones, Panzer's guidance isn't very effective against modern jamming by a powerful enemy. And Israel has a big and rich military, heavily equipped with state-of-the-art jamming systems. Alternatively, multiple drones can still overwhelm Panzer. When a single Panzer vehicle costs 15 million and its crew is beyond value, it's easy to spend even a bit more on the drones attacking it. Besides drones armed with missiles, kamikaze drones were also used a lot in Nagorno-Karabakh. Indeed, said loitering suicide weapons were praised for their effectiveness by Azeri officials. Now, the Israeli Harap is a fairly complex system. It can even return home if no target is found. The initial price tag with comms equipment, launchers, guidance stations and so on can rise up to 10 million dollars per one aircraft. But as Indian procurement of further Harps showed, subsequent drones themselves, once the ecosystem is in place, cost perhaps a million or two per drone. So does that mean drones have become unstoppable? Not necessarily. Pretty much all the examples of their effective use have been in environments where one side is much richer and much more potent in other military areas. So drones were simply a tool to achieve victory with little to no casualties and with even smaller material cost, than to lose, say, a whole F-16. Richer and stronger militaries, as always in history, can afford to leverage their advantages through technology. 
But what would happen if two countries of the same technological level and strength would try to rely on aerial combat drones? There would be multiple issues in such a conflict. All drones need to be commanded. Today, the AI is still quite far away from actually picking routes, identifying contacts and deciding to engage targets on their own which means the potential of jamming the drones or severing their data link lines through which they get commands could be their Achilles heel. That doesn't work against drone sensors, for the most part. Most of the drones mentioned rely on optical sensors. Those can't be jammed, but navigation and data links can. So satellites, as well as emitters both on ground stations and the drones themselves can be jammed. Of course, it is not that easy. There are two means of sending commands to the drone and receiving feedback from drones, via line of sight ground based data links and via satellites. But all those are directional emissions. If the ground station is at a location A and the drone is at a location B, for communication jamming to be easy, the jammer must really be in between the two. Because unlike with jamming radars, where the radar signal that returns to the radar is mostly the same one as the send signal, when a ground station or a satellite sends one signal, the drone secretly responds in another signal. To fake the returning signal or barrage the receiver with multiple similar signals easily, one has to first capture the signal. That can be very hard to do in warfare, especially against a pure opponent. It does however mean even drones can't afford to venture far out over the front line, otherwise their comms might be more easily severed by jamming. The drone command needs a station where the crew of the drone resides. It is usually not threatened as it can be hidden. But the communication array can't be very well hidden as it is blaring electronic emissions all the time as it talks to the drone. For an opponent which is weaker to begin with, putting a plane to the sky, listening and locating where the emissions come from and then sending something to attack that location can be an unsurmountable issue. For such an attack, specialized and expensive allant platforms must be available. And getting through the enemy defenses, sometimes over 200 kilometers away from the drone itself, can be a huge issue, if not enough fighter escorts or smart weapons are available. So air superiority goes a long way in drone warfare of two peer opponents. Besides communications, drones and their missiles can use navigation satellites. But all those satellites are so high up, at 18 or 35,000 kilometers, that almost no country in the world can actually kill them. That's a whole other topic, so suffice to say that outside of the US, China and Russia, it's not realistic to expect anything like it. Jamming comm signals from satellites to a drone, that's very hard to do, as it would mean placing something continuously over the drone and in between it and the satellite. While in the past satellite navigation was described as easy to jam, that really refers to commercial use equipment. High-tech military navigation receivers reject any signals not coming from specific directions. Now, it has to be said that jamming could still be performed by a platform in front of the data link antenna, but it would have to be a very powerful and high-tech jammer platform, covering pretty much all possible frequencies and signal modulations that the drone might use at the same time. Such jammers are usually not practical and are not available to most nations, except for the US and the like. And even then, actual tactical availability of such jammers might be scarce compared to the number of drones on the battlefield. Ground-based jammers are an imperfect solution, as they are not mobile enough. They could protect only a fairly small area and allow the enemy to simply attack around it. Their low altitude position also usually means they can't really jam the faraway data link array, but only the drone itself. Another issue that might beset the drone users is bandwidth. The US military has been vocal about the lack of bandwidth since the spike in needs in 2003. While the technology marches on, offering more and more bandwidth, drone use is also growing constantly. If a large-scale war happens, bandwidth use might locally spike up so high that some drones might not have enough free frequencies or channels to be used. That limit is a danger both to satellite communications and ground-based data link stations. Which is why drone swarm tactics of the future are usually put in context of a much greater use of artificial intelligence and self-reliance. So what would happen if two countries near peer opponents, both well equipped with numerous and varied drones, went to war? 
the US and China fit all the described points. Drones would fly, definitely, but unlike various Reaper-sized or even smaller drones, it's large drones that would be more useful. Jet-powered ones, flying higher, faster and being more stealthy. Those would still be hard-pressed to actually loiter over enemy territory and survive, but they would perform surgical strikes on predetermined targets, or would scout from afar with very powerful sensors. Perhaps the biggest difference would be air monitoring. In a war of weaker belligerents, radar coverage is usually not full but intermittent and not long-range, blocked by terrain features, as aerial-based radars can't be afforded. When big countries go to war, multiple platforms would be monitoring the airspace a few hundred miles over the front line. While drones do have somewhat smaller radar returns, unless we're talking about dedicated stealthy drones, which would be quite expensive, detection ranges against them would be considerable. Coupled with the fairly slow speed of drones, there would be far fewer surprises, and both sides might have more time to focus their defenses in vital areas. The likes of Reaper or such drones would be very vulnerable. They're slow, they're not that hard to spot by modern-day SAM and fighter jet radars, and they're basically easy prey without radar warning sensors, chaff, flares, decoys, etc. One modern missile might very well achieve over 90% of effectiveness rate against such targets. Unlike semi-disposable kamikaze drones, drones like Reaper are quite pricey and could cost 15 million dollars each much more than missiles. Even the simpler Turkish Bayraktar drones cost five or so million, and that's with lower wage costs in Turkey. So going much farther over the front line would not be feasible. Operating combat drones right over the front line would however be very much in vogue. Loitering suicide drones would be used on a large scale, for sure. In a way, US cruise missiles are already such weapons as they can circle for hours and receive fresh targeting data. The US also uses small drones capable of kamikaze attacks, such as Switchblade and Coyote, but they're of a different class, really. They're very tactical, platoon-level weapons. Which points to the possibility that for engaging SAMs of peer opponents, the US still believes heavy and fast and large platforms are the way to go. That can apply to large jamming planes being used instead of smaller jammer drones or large stand of recon platforms being used in place of small short-range recon drones, or cruise missiles, used just like kamikaze drones, to go after individual SAM sites. The Chinese are, for example, very much proliferating a special class of anti-aircraft artillery, simple enough to be cheap and with a very limited capability but one tailored seemingly against kamikaze UAVs, incoming missiles and so on. Old-style anti-air artillery had a more varied mission set, but it can be fairly complex and expensive. Simpler, newer class AAA systems are proliferating, trading fire rate and in some instances sensors for range and caliber. Basically AAA tailored against slower incoming targets flying in fairly simple patterns. Against very simple UAVs, like various small-form quadcopters, which are designed to be cheap and disposable, even jamming by fairly simple jammers can work. If the overall defense system tracks the threat first and has jammers available everywhere and deployed. Which can be a tall order. Still, given that each such handheld jammer or vehicle mounted drone detector doesn't really cover a large area, they are quite pricey toys. Which is why we have only now, in the last few years, seen the likes of NATO militaries and police units procure such equipment. Against quadcopters, other cheap light drones and not-so-organized belligerents, they can probably be cost-efficient. But against bigger opponents with dozens of bigger UAVs, such measures are unlikely to work, warranting the use of more traditional anti-aircraft networks, which is what it really boils down to. If one has a vast, multi-layered radar network and SAM network, drone attacks will not be easily performed. If one is lagging behind in money and technology, then drones might become the bane of their existence. Oh, and the future? Who knows what countermeasures will be available once AI-controlled drone swarms find their way to the battlefield. And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together.